Yes, thank you very much for, uh, for coming on. Thank you very much to Rabbi Olitsky. We really appreciate your courtesy. Uh, rabbi is the rabbi of a congregation in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, we, we encountered each other because I read an article in the foreword in which he was quoted, and uh, he, was, he was so erudite and so well-spoken that I thought he would make an excellent presenter, and he was kind enough to agree to do so. So, Rabbi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alan, and thanks uh, to everyone for having me. Um, you know, the, the conversation really um, began surrounding one of these uh, op-eds that I wrote most recently um, after the murder of George Floyd, um, but when Alan gave me the opportunity to, to speak with this group, knowing that we were really from, you know, across the country and connected with different synagogues, um, I was anticipating a different moment in time than when Alan first asked me, which is many of us have had institutions that have been shut down for five or six months and likely will continue to be shut down for at least another several. Um, I don't know about you, but those of you who are part of synagogues that don't have preschools are in a very different state or day schools are in a very dis different situation than those that do. Right. So most of the synagogues here in the twin cities that don't have a preschool or day school have already announced that they're staying closed through January 1st. And um, our institution has been closed since March. We're planning on making an attempt to uh, reopen our preschool in about a month. Um, our preschool generally has 180 students, um, and we're only going to permit uh, 80 students or 85 students, give or take. Um, and about half of our families have said that our protocols are not stringent enough and they're not, uh, they're concerned about sending their kids. And another half have said that our protocols are too strict and they're sending a uh, concern about sending their kids. So I don't even know if we're going to end up opening. What I do know is the high holy days um, will all be virtual and I would be my, my prediction right now is I would be shocked if we're physically back in the building before Passover. Um, I would be shocked if we're physically back in the building before Passover. Um, and that has led us to really rethink a number of different things, which I'll come back to, but the very first piece, uh, I want to talk about, uh, outreach. I don't remember what we effectively called this. I think we were calling this outreach in the, in the time of COVID-19, um, I, I want to talk about m at least six different areas. And the first piece is, I think it's the plight of almost all uh, synagogues in North America, um, certainly in the United States, likely in Canada, and less so in Mexico, but almost all synagogues in North America and almost all conservative and reform synagogues, most mainstream Orthodox, less so the modern Orthodox, and less so the independent Minyani. And that we, fa we fall into a relatively dastardly pattern of being in the business of being in business. And what I mean by that is we forget what our mission, our organization's mission is, and we end up doing things that are in the business of being in business. So you might, now I'm talking to a group of lay leaders here, right? So let's talk about operational staff driven situations. If a synagogue has a car wash or a bake sale or a speaker event, right? And I'm not talking about my synagogue, we'll come back to that, um, or an annual gala or dinner, benefit dinner, or Cantor's concert, or whatever it might be, what is the primary goal of that? Yeah, Bruce said it, although he's on mute, to make money, right? Right? The primary goal is to make money. The secondary goal, you might say, it's to bring people together, it's to present Jewish music, it's to, but at the end of the day, if you're not making money, you're probably not doing that event right? Some of us have been lucky about being able to do an event that makes a lot of money and is mission critical. But most of the time, it ends up being the former, not the latter. It's all about, you know, the fundraising. And what ends up happening is if we look at our staff resources of our synagogue, we end up finding a situation where an 
and disproportionately overwhelming amount of staff resource, time, and energy is spent on that percentage of programming opportunity that is actually about being in the business of being in business. Okay. And when you actually think about those times where the synagogue recruits its lay leadership to be involved in things, some of that happens to be also. How much energy is spent looking for volunteer ushers for insert event here, as opposed to building your Bikur Holim committee, right? How many are spent trying to find volunteer, um, let's talk about the stereotypical men's club, volunteer grillers barbecue at the preschool benefit picnic or brunch or matzo brai lunch or whatever it might be, as opposed to, okay. Now, I, I bring this up because most of us, this hasn't been a problem, right? Especially if you're making money, right? You might be failing to, put, to fulfill your mission or provide on your mission, but being in the business, being in business, if you're successful, it means you're transforming the institution and you're spinning your wheels, but it's a different ball game. I bring this up because during this pandemic, most, if not all, of those things that we were doing are dead in the water. And they're pivoting maybe to a virtual format, but all of a sudden we think to ourselves, why are we doing this? Right? Especially if we're not going to raise that money. And so this pandemic, I believe, has turned us all back into a situation where we are recentering and redefining our institutions of what is the mission of our institution. Because we, for far too long, have been in the business of being in business. Now, money does not grow on trees, okay? I know that. And, and we don't all have, um, we don't have angel donors to do this, that, and the other. But to give you a little bit of a sense where I'm coming from, my synagogue got rid of dues and membership several years ago. Okay? We do not have dues. We do not have membership. And I'm not, to be clear, I'm not saying that, you know, like the institutions that talk about um, uh, voluntary dues or, you know, we're going to send you an invoice but not call it an invoice, right? That, that's not what we did. And it was painful for the transition. It took us several years. And this pandemic has, thank God we did this because it actually positioned us better as a result of the pandemic and we have to figure out how to navigate that. But it helped us realize that there's a difference between outreach and K-Roof. Okay? Many of us use terms K-Roof, right? If I asked you what K-Roof meant, especially with the work of that FJMC has done over the years and the and conservative movement has done in areas, K-Roof people would define as outreach. K-Roof does not mean outreach, okay? Correct, Sandy, so draw people close, draw people near. So here is what K-Roof is. Oh, you're all the way over there, Sandy? Let me bring you to me. Outreach is, oh, you're all the way over there, Sandy? Let me go to you. That's the difference. The mission of the synagogue is outreach, not K-Roof. The mission of the synagogue used to be K-Roof, but America changed in the 1950s. And the mission of the synagogue hasn't been K-Roof since the 1950s. The mission of the synagogue is meeting people where they are. And that's physically, financially, spiritually, emotionally, all these different ways. And so if we say to ourselves, gee, I wonder why people didn't come to that program, and we don't immediately think to ourselves, maybe it was a bad program. Maybe it was poorly conceived, right? Maybe it was poorly deployed, right? As opposed to, oh, I thought it was great. I, right? We're not meeting people where they are. So the first two pieces that I want us to think about is one, how do we pivot from being in business of being in business, right? And two, how do we pivot from K-Roof to outreach? Now, both of those are forced situations in the age of coronavirus, okay? I will not teach a study group 
right? It, when I was at Bethel, physically, I would have no problem meeting with one person studying one-on-one. -on -one. I might not have a problem if I met with a couple people, if I felt, if our women's league, which has aged and has grown smaller and smaller, if I met with five or seven, the mission was not to engage so many people, it was to make our women's league joyful and feel engaged. I will not do that during this time because that is not a good use of synagogue resources, right? Already we have 16 people, it looks like I'm looking on the screen right now, okay? If I don't have 40 to 50 people in a study group, that is not a good use of synagogue resources. Because right now, what we're understanding is there are no walls. There are no members. There is no such thing as a congregation anymore in this pandemic. The world is the congregation. And if we don't begin to understand that as institutions, we're gonna all get left behind, right? Imagine if the major sports uh, leagues tried, instead of putting their Super Bowl, Stanley Cup finals, whatever, on NBC, ABC, Fox, CBS, they put it on HBO, right? They put it on Showtime. They put it on pay-per-view. They're actually trying to meet as many people as possible, not make the money from those people, right? They want a larger audience because their revenue model comes from the advertisers, so they want to get as far as possible. Synagogues are the same, and right now, as we pivot toward this pandemic, I have to tell you that the world has changed. And when I say the world has changed is we will one day be back in our building and I would be shocked if we stop doing Zoom Minyani. I would be shocked if we don't have an iPad physically present at every Minyan that we do now in the building. I would be shocked if I am not teaching study groups every single day virtually. Right? And, you know... How many of our snowbirds who had not yet come back to town were all of a sudden now engaged in the synagogue in ways that they never had been? Why? Because there are no walls. Now, if you're in an institution that says, well, you know, my shul only tries to reach our members because if we don't, I'm going to reach those members and this synagogue is going to get upset because we're poaching this, that, and the other we have to stop try treating people as commodities. We have to go back to our mission. There are, no one owns anyone else. We now, in our daily minion, we have, we have two minion in a day, right? Shachrit and Mincha right now every day. And on Shabbat, you know, we're, we're doing everything on Zoom, including Shabbat. We have people logging into our minyanim from Minnesota, from Chicago, from Florida, from Texas, from New Jersey, from Detroit, from Los Angeles, from uh, Chile, from, we actually did a bat mitzvah for a young girl in Chile, um, and they found us. We started off by doing Zoom and live simulcasting on Facebook. Then in the age of the security of Zoom bombing and things like that, we stopped doing our minyanim on Facebook and only doing our study groups as a simulcast. So to give you another example, I have a Christian colleague um, down the street who I'm quite, quite close with. And Wednesday evenings, we've done this holy happy hour where we have a Zoom room, the two of us have a beer, we invite a guest, we talk, we debate, we discuss, we ask different questions, we bring on significant personalities. It's almost like a live podcast that you watch. We simulcast it, do a Facebook watch party on five different streams. We have 2,000 people watching it as a sum total of all five. Okay? We've never 
had that type of programming in the synagogue for just a, a conversation with the clergy. Right? This has changed how we do things. This is how we change how we do things. Now, I notice Gregory Gore m mentioned Shabbat service attendance has increased during COVID. The question is tracking the unique visitors or the repeat attendees. Because you have lurkers, right? People who are trying things out, they're bored. Um, and if, no, it's someone said, is it Rabbi Fine? No, it's Christian clergy. It's uh, my friend, Pastor Paul Bodwin. It's a, a, a minister and a rabbi having the conversation. Um, so you have this balance of are people coming back and are they looking for more? Are they wanting more? Are they engaging more? And here's how I knew we were doing the right thing. Because these people from all different cities started making donations to the synagogue. And they said, we want to join the synagogue. And we said, that's great. We don't have members, but we accept your tzedakah. And some of them are actually giving more than what our uh, fair share dues used to be. Right? So this has all been about trying to understand what it is. But it goes back to now the next three tiers. I'm going to pause in a minute to take questions about any of that because I'm, I'm teeing up the whole point of how we're going to get there. Okay? So let's pause for a moment. Any questions on what I or thoughts of what I've put out there so far? Yeah, Sandy. You just have done. Yeah. I know there was a big push of a while ago for, for congregations to talk about having no dues and moving to a different model. I'm not that familiar with that. I don't think we can do it. So if you don't have dues in the traditional way, where is it that you get your funds? Yeah, so it's it's not about the traditional way. It's all about what it, what is the revenue model, right? right? right. So, right. so first of all, I would encourage you to go on Amazon. I wrote a book with my father, Rabbi Kerry Olitsky, on this. You can nice. check it out, and it, it, it can, there's a whole map in the back on what you could conceive of for your synagogue. Um, dues don't work, period, right? But let me ask you this. Raise your hand if your synagogue has a balanced budget and you have dues. <laughs> okay? And I don't mean balanced budget by borrowing from the endowment and calling one extra donor every year, and I don't mean, right? Raise your hand if you have a synagogue that your dues cover all of your revenue for the synagogue. Right? You have to do a fundraiser. You have to do the, you, you do a Yisker appeal. You do all these, right? Dues don't work. And I've never met anyone who gets their dues invoice, writes a check to the synagogue and says, you know, I feel really good about that. Most people get the invoice, feel like they're paying a Jewish tax, write a check, and then kind of lament it. Giving to one synagogue should be a joyful thing, not a, a lamented burden. And so, Sandy, you asked the question, where does it come from? Well, think about alternative revenue models in, in society right now, right? I'll give you a couple. Do you pay to use Google? No. Why not? Well, there used to be paid search engines back in the 90s, right? You don't have that anymore because there are ways to navigate. Do you pay to go to the shopping mall? Right? What are, the, what are the added benefits? What are the services you could buy? What are the ways that you could generate revenue? Right? So, for example, let's say, what's a, Sandy, where do you go to school? Highland Park, Illinois. Okay, Highland Park, Illinois. Um, let's say all things being equal. Okay? I'm sure there are many members of your congregation that uh, go to Milts, right? Or used to go to Milts, right? Yeah, yeah. Fine. So Milts has a food truck, right? I think they do. They do. Okay. Why don't you guys operate another one? You fund the food truck, you buy the food truck, and you take 25% off the top. Kind of ironic because my son is a trained chef and um, he right. could have done that, but Chicago, anyway, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. You know, so 
So I'll give you an example like that that we'll come back to, which now I'm trying to rethink in this pandemic. So we do a two Bishvat Seder every year, okay? It's $125 a head. We bring in four James Beard award-winning chefs. It's an eight-course wine dinner. We limit it to 180 people. It costs us $100,000 to put on, and we don't make any money. We break even. It is not a fundraiser. That's one of those events that is about the mission. About a third of the room isn't Jewish. We have people from the ages of 21 through 91 who come. Okay? We won't be able to do it that way this year. But when we conceived of it as a fundraiser, we couldn't make it happen. When we conceived of it as simply breaking even, getting donations in kind about the community building, the education, the learning, the innovation, no one else does something like this in the country, right? We were nominated for a local award in the secular press for it, okay? All of a sudden, it became something different. I'm and coming when you're in the building. Sorry? I'm coming when you're in the building. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, in fact, you ask about revenue. I just had a phone call today with the Israeli consulate in Chicago who gave us a grant to do it last year, right? As the, as the synagogue in Highland Park asked for money from the consulate, right? I mean, revenue comes from everywhere, right? Revenue comes from everywhere, right? We, we brought in Neil deGrasse Tyson to come speak a handful of years ago, and I got money from the Science Museum and money from the Museum of Natural History here, and they paid for him to come. And we charged tickets and collected the revenue. And it was all about education because we were trying to combat all of the creationists, right? So it was like, okay. So this brings me to what is the purpose of the Your Synagogue? I can't, I can't answer that for you. Each of us have different shuls with different settings. Some of us are synagogues. You, you, you mentioned my brother, Jesse. My brother's synagogue in, in South Orange, New Jersey, is built around social justice, right? My brother's institution, their, their bread and butter is social justice work. Some synagogues don't do any social justice. Some synagogues, it's all about learning, right? You have people that are all day filling the institution, and it's all about learning. You have some where it's about youth engagement, right? You have kids crawling off the walls in the preschool and the USY in the, you know, the high school, the college programming. You have some where it's about um, life cycle events. You've got six bar mitzvahs every week. You know, you've got baby namings and funerals to the, and then some are just the Hamish, a small, you know, mom and pop feel, right? Where you've got 80 families and it feels good. And you, everybody knows your name and, this is a community, and then you have somewhere it's a community. What is your mission? To me, a synagogue should be doing really several things. Providing comfort, building community, and engaging the unengaged. Providing comfort, building community, and engaging the unengaged. The pandemic has allowed us to do all three of those things in ways none of us have ever previously conceived. Okay, so on one hand, a good example was, I don't know if you have a, a community Seder on your second night Seder, right? If you do, ask yourself the question, why do we have it? Right? You charge $50 to come. Is it so that people don't want to cook at home and they were going to have a Seder anyway? Is it because you have people who didn't uh, have a place to go and no one was willing to invite them? So you have a group of people who probably couldn't afford it and they're coming there. Or all of a sudden you realize like, wow, how many people had Sedarim in their home and their Bubby who lives in Baltimore was able to attend their Seder in Los Angeles and never would have done that. Or now you have people who are conceiving of all these new recipes because they actually were spending time on YouTube or they were learning how to kosher and cook with this and this. And none of it was put on by the synagogue. None of it, right, was catalyzed by the synagogue. How many people have taken up baking challah every week? Not catalyzed by the synagogue. 
how much do we understand what we could be looking at what people are already doing, getting in front of them, getting ahead of it, and saying, we could offer that. We could be doing that. Right? We could be providing that. Because those annual dinners, what? So you're going to pivot and do it online to raise the money, right? Those retreats, you're going to do a virtual one, right? I could, I could be thrilled and say, we wouldn't have had this conversation, right? We wouldn't have had this conversation. How many of you would have attended a study session that wouldn't have necessarily existed at, but for FJMC doing this as a result of the pandemic, right? How are we providing comfort? How are we building community? How are we engaging? And the answer is really one theme and one theme alone. And that is defining relevance. Defining relevance. The pandemic has forced us to not be relevant, but to divine relevance. We are relevant because this is what relevance is, right? So as opposed to, we heard that that shul did this, that's a really good idea, we should try to do that, right? We heard that that shul did this, that's a really good idea, we should try to do this. It's more along the lines of, what is no one else doing that all of our congregants already are? that we should be getting ahead of, right? Is anyone thinking about Simchat Torah yet? Okay. And are you thinking about Simchat Torah and saying, how can we do what we already normally do and do that virtually? Or are you saying, wow, we maybe need to figure out a new way to celebrate Simchat Torah, right? Passover was amazing virtually. Tisha B'Av sucked. Right? Go ahead, Sandy. Yeah. We, we actually had our chazan um, organized with three other congregations and their chazanim and rabbis, and we had four congregations together and actually a very meaningful um, presentation. I noticed that, because um, I go to Shul a lot, normal, <laughs> and there actually were fewer people from my synagogue, but there were people who I know don't usually come who came on Zoom, and there were a couple of hundred people on this. Um, so, so we had a similar situation with Shavuot. We came together as most of the Minnesota rabbis. Um, there were a handful of congregations that opted out, um, and we did a Twin Cities-wide tikkun this year. We normally have a tikkun Lao Shavuot that goes from, you know, lich benchen, candle lighting, all the way to sunrise hashkama mini in the next morning and we have 200 people at the peak in the evening and we have 20 25 people left in the morning and it's just our congregation usually we did this twin cities wide one almost none of our congregation attended almost none and it was the first year in i don't know 20 years that i ended up falling asleep and not staying up all night because normally what keeps me up is eating peanut m ms and walking from this guy's house to that girl's house Right, and walking from this woman's house to his house and going around with my friends. And the, the real learning is the conversation in the street at two in the morning. And right, we didn't do a good job and we were tired, and that's why we did it. Right. And we I'm had, hopeful that they, sorry. We had joint we had joint learning for the week preceding, um, because we didn't zoom. I don't think we zoomed on Shavuot, just maybe Arab Shavuot, but yep. we had eight different sessions. We were supposed to have Rabbi Michael Schwab's installation with Rabbi Joel Roth. And so Rabbi Joel Roth gave a shiur the day before Shavuot. Most of the people who were on the three congregations actually were from Bethel. Um, and again, yeah. people who didn't normally come, but certainly it wasn't our normal 200 people either. So, so part of this is we've now reached Zoom fatigue. So no longer is it about Zoom. No. Right. Right. You know, you know, how many of us are trying to think about, um, you know, how are we going to blow shofar this year? Instead of going back to the question, why do we blow shofar this year? And then saying, okay, if blowing shofar is about, you know, waking people up. Well, I don't know about you, but today was the first Wednesday of the month. Here, 
in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, the first Wednesday of the month is when they test the tornado sirens. Mm -hmm. I have an email into our mayor about plugging in a shofar blowing into the tornado sirens and seeing if we could do that. Right? You know, the city of Minneapolis did the muazin during uh, Ramadan and the mayor allowed them to do a, a communal call in the city for times of prayer for, for those, you know, Muslims who are observing Ramadan and they did it over to the, right? So maybe we could do something like this, right? Now, I don't know if we really can and I don't know if it's practical. I don't really know how that works, but it's not, how else can we do that? It's what can we use that's already in place? What can we do that people are already doing? How can we navigate that? How can we navigate that? We're going to have individual shofar blowers perhaps go in front of their own home and invite congregants to come to their home so they can blow and they can hear in different let me, neighborhoods. Let me, let me challenge you another direction. Okay? We haven't done this. I don't know if we do this, but I'll give you the idea. Because, again, it's about, right? Remember we talked about comfort, community, engagement, defining relevance, outreach, not K-roof. Okay? Let's say a shofar costs a hundred dollars okay let's say you sold shofar rot or and look if it's about making money you, you sell them for 120 dollars or you get someone to underwrite however many okay and let's say let's pretend money is no object because we could figure out the revenue model but you send shofar rot unsolicited to 200 community members strategically placed around your city. You get some to fund it and you tell them all at this time on this day, everyone go outside and you will then train them the, you know, their rabbi, your ball, your ball, okay, whomever it is, is going to get up on zoom and you're going to train them all to blow. And they're all going to go at the same time. And all of a sudden people are going to say, what is going on? Right. We're talking about that. Right. And then after Yuntif, you know, you send out a note. Did you hear that blast today? This was the first year that we were from many one. Right. This was the first year that we actually recreated what it was like 2000 years ago. Right. You know, and all of a sudden we never would have conceived of doing something like that. Right. Every year we have Tashlich and not so many people come. What's Tashlich going to look like this year? We're thinking creatively about that. But it brings me to the last piece. And that last piece, before we open up to a little bit of Q&A and then come back to the summary, is we have to redefine diversity. We have to redefine diversity, right? I, I'm thrilled that, you know, men's club has moved away from being just about men Okay, I'm thrilled that men's club in, in some congregations has moved away from being just about men. But, and I do believe there is a space within a congregation for men's club and women's club and not, I'm not talking about binary and gender insensitivity and things like that, but like there are men's issues and there are women's issues and there, you know, there's, okay. What does it mean to be diverse? What does it mean to be a diverse population? What does it mean to be diverse in your programming? What does it mean to be diverse in your politics? What, do mean, mean, what does it mean to be diverse in your socioeconomic status? What does it mean to be diverse in your geography? And if there's a voice not at this table, then you are not yet diverse. Now that doesn't mean you have to be all things to all people, right? Because you gotta go back to your mission. But I'll give you an example. It just came out the top, what, 50 businesses in, in Minnesota, I think it was. I'll tell you one second. It was the top, uh, top 500 or top 50? Top, top paid public company CEOs in Minnesota, okay? And there are, let's see, 50. Of the 50, four are women and two are people of color, okay? 
Minnesota being a place where we talk about diversity and how diverse we are. Here's the So I, I posted about it. And I'm going to come back to this posting piece. I posted about it. And I, you know, got flack from some people and support from others. And we engaged in dialogue, not like a scree online, but we talked about it. And we traded articles and we went back and forth. I've been posting every single day, three times a day. Okay. And I've been placing an op-ed every single week in a different publication. I didn't do it. Where do you, where do you post? Um, the New York Times, the New York oh, Jewish fine. Week, the okay. Forward, New okay. Jersey Jewish News before they stopped, you know, um, you. Madison State Journal, Jewish Journal, you know, I, I mean, really all over. Um, Minnesota Reformer, Star Tribune, Chicago Sun Tribune has not been interested because I don't live in Chicago. Um, but, uh, you know, but in any event, um, uh, I, I never did this before the pandemic. But I realized people were already reading the news. They're reading social media all over the place. So the only way to reach them is to get in front of them in a way that they're already doing. And it's engaged and it's created. And, I, and we started realizing, wow, here are voices that we had not heard from. How can we elevate those voices? How can we pass the mic? How can we change that? Right? Matanot la'anim. Right, you give to um, uh, you give to the rabbi for Maot Chitim for making a donation before Passover or giving a donation for Purim, and then the rabbi goes and then distributes privately. And is there an announcement in the congregation? If you are in need, come reach us, or is it going seeking them out, or is it? everyone going and partnering with the food show, right? How many of your congregations have posted to make a donation to the, to the Lebanese Red Cross today, right? Or is it we can't because, you know, politics? Or is it we're only going to work with the Federation? Or that's not part of our funding structure? Or, right? Or if you can't do it at the synagogue, how many of your lay leaders have? How many of your rabbis have, Right? Or is it just a blip in the news? Those are the questions about relevance and meaning. If you're, not, if you're talking about something at your dinner table, right? You go home and you're talking about something with your family at your dinner table. And that conversation is not present within the programming at your synagogue, then your synagogue does not remain to be relevant. Right, your synagogue does not remain to be relevant. You know, I, I am. Uh, my last point before I kind of open it up for questions and answers, and we can pivot a little bit, is I'm a huge hockey fan. I haven't skated in five, six months, and I lament. I I try to play two to three times a week, um, and I watch religiously. I haven't. I, I tried to watch one game a week ago. I I thought it was stupid. Like I don't understand what we're doing. I it was maybe like exhibition. I happen to be a New York Rangers fan. Were it were the Rangers ever swept in the playoffs and lost three games in a row? I'm not saying I'd be saying Kaddish, but I'd be in a pretty bad place. I didn't even realize they lost last night. And that's not because the pandemic has changed my uh my awareness. It's just, it's not relevant right now. It's, it's air sats, it's saccharin, right? And, and it feels that way. I mean, baseball is an even better example when you got cardboard cutouts in the, in the, in the stands, right? I mean, it's a joke. And so I have a virtual background right now, okay? I did this on purpose. I actually have different virtual backgrounds. This virtual background is what I use every time I'm at Minion. And I do it because those who come to our regular Minion miss seeing the synagogue. And so this was a subtle way that I could say, look, the shul's right behind me. And when we have a study group, just to change it, I say, okay, you know what? We'll be in our learning center, right? And now we're in our learning center. But if I'm just meeting with the congregant face-to-face, 
then I'm going to say, you know what? I'm in my home. You're in your home. And this is an intimate gathering. And I don't even mention it. But people have noticed. Because it's about relevance. It's about navigating it differently. And so we'll come back to the very beginning when we get to the end. But I want to pause there and open it up if there are questions or thoughts or clarifications that people feel like they need on anything that I've shared thus far. Yeah, Alan, go ahead. Alan, then Sandy. You're on mute there, Alan. Yep. Should I go while he's trying to figure it out? No, I think he just got there. I think Great. I got it now. Sorry about that. Okay, so I guess my question is, how are you determining what your the needs are of your congregation in this in this situation? I mean, I, you've made certain moves and they've been successful, but did you, did you do surveys, focus groups? Did you where did this come from? So, I, are you talking about financial needs or? No, no, no. Talk about the. I'm talking about the outreach you've been talking about. Yeah. So, you know, look, I think that there are two different pieces, right? And this, this has to be about what it means to be an innovation in response. And you'll forgive me for quoting an anti-Semite, but when Henry Ford was interviewed by the press, when he came out with the automobile, right? There were a couple of journalists who asked him and said, you know, if you ask the people what they wanted, is this what they would have said? He said, if I asked the people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses, <laughs> right? It's actually one of my favorite you know, you know, apocryphal anecdotes, because in a sense, that's what the role of the shul is, right? You know, there, there's, it's one thing to create a business and say, we've got a problem we need to solve. People got runny noses, we're going to create Kleenex, okay? But, but it's not about saying, right, what does Kleenex then do once they create Kleenex? They then engage in a campaign to tell you, you need Kleenex, and not only that, I put aloe in your Kleenex because your nose is getting sore from using the Kleenex that I first invented. And so now I'm going to make it softer. You need to buy this one. So, Alan, it's, it's less about learning from people what they need, although I'll tell you, if your shul is large enough, you're going to hear from people what they need, right? If your shul is large enough, you know, and I'm not saying that the squeaky wheel always gets the grease, but some of that is there. But also, it takes... One, right, if, if I go right now, here, I'll give you a perfect example. I'm going to open up, so CARE 11 is our local NBC affiliate, okay? I'm going to spitball with you for a moment. I'm opening up the CARE 11 app. First article is about no charges against a fatal shooting of a man with autism. Second article has to do with live Department of Health reports of COVID. Third article is a President Trump press conference. Fourth article, Como Zoo donors informed of data breach. Fifth article, an abundance of beavers may be helping Voyager's moose population. Okay? Now, five articles that probably are irrelevant to you in Chicago and Los Angeles and New Jersey, wherever we are. One of them already speaks to me and says, you know, abundance of beavers may be helping Voyager's moose population. And I'm going to say, how many people are thinking about that? And I'm going to, now you don't know about Voyager's National Park, right? Or, right in Minnesota. It's a really impressive park that is primarily water-based. And I'm going to say, you know, that's in the news because people are going to parks right now. People are going to state parks. People are going to national parks. They're going outdoor. There's man. I'm going to say, how fascinating would it be if the synagogue provided a Shabbat travel pack when you go camping with your family or you go to spend a weekend away at Voyagers. No one's asking for that, but guess what? I'm going to tell you, Alan, you need it because don't you want to do Shabbat? And if you're someone who comes in on Zoom every week, you're not going to be able to do that when you're at the state park. You're not going to have a signal. You're going to do. So I'm going to give you a Shabbat pack. It's going to be, and I'm not talking about the traditional, uh, you know, preschool Shabbat box. I'm not talking about just the candles, whatever. I'm talking about I'm going to give you dehydrated vegetarian chicken soup that you could put out there 
We're going to give you this, that, and we're going to make it. And you can put it for sale or not. And that's just looking at one thing that's just the relevance within the news, right? If I, if I opened, you know, the Chicago, uh, the, the Tribune or whatever it might be, we might be able to pull a different one. Now, the other option, if you want to be a little bit less innovative and creative, even though federations are different in each community, the federation should have a pretty sense of what the communal needs are, communal desires are. And you can send out a survey. But I'll tell you what, if you post it on social media, just one question, what would people like to see the shul do? I guarantee you get five answers. You might even get 50, right? And, and yeah, sure, it's luck of the draw, but now you make one of those people who gave the answer the hero of the cause and let it, you know, dovetail and, and exponentially expand. It would be really compelling. could be really, really compelling, right? We had a perfect example. We wanted to start doing a, vo uh, a Voices of Color lecture series following um, uh, George Floyd's murder. And so we realized we hadn't really been doing this. It's not charged. It's for free. We started reaching out. And one of our students said, Rabbi, are you considering this? I said, sure, give me a list of names. Made the contacts, and we've already, you know, had several. 100 people in attendance at each one from all over. But part of that is about putting it out there, social media, experience, you know, spreading the word, messaging. So it's a good question. Sandy, you had a question? Sorry. I guess I'm looking for some, I, I understand what you're saying by making it relevant, by making it the outreach instead of the K-Ruv. I always think of K-Ruv as the outreach to the non-Jewish, but whatever. I, I guess I'm looking, we're a large congregation with a thousand families, member, member units. And I think that we've done a good job in certain areas. We too have two minyan a day. day. Um, We've called since April people 80 and over. We're making other connections. But I think a good, some good friends of ours came over last night to pick up something, sat in the backyard for half an hour, and halfway through he said, you know, we're feeling really disconnected from the synagogue. And I was like, whoa, these are people who are actually connected, but they're not going to, whatever. Do you have sort of like specific ideas of, you know, because we live in Chicago, so in a couple of months, it will be too cold to be outside. We haven't really done, as a synagogue, things outside. We've had a few minyanim oh, outdoors, yep. outdoors but, that's, but that's it. And I think I make 10-plus calls every Friday to 80-plus-year-olds, and there are other people like me who are really craving the social interaction. Do you have ideas of what we might do for the next six, eight weeks while the weather is okay to you know, I, I, to, to get together. We were supposed to have a, a what if they were going to do campfire songs on Sunday night. People could come to the synagogue and pick up for 10 bucks a package of s'mores and something else. But that was all on Zoom. The campfire was just going to be for the few people doing it. Um, and yeah, then I, they think, look, I can tell you one of the things that's been really big and this, is, you know, it, look, I think age is a challenge and I think reaching that senior population is the biggest challenge and that's got to be direct outreach, FaceTime. We have our staff has spent a significant time actually troubleshooting for our seniors, their technology issues. But we've actually done a good job contacting them and we're trying to help them with the tech. Yeah. I mean, and I don't mean just contacting. I mean, our seniors know if they call the synagogue, they will get IT support, like literal IT support. I, I can't get my Zoom to work. I, I tried to call my son. I get, not for synagogue programming. I mean, literal who, IT support. Who, 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 and then who is that support? Um, staff people or, or volunteers? Our, yeah, our admin staff. Our admin staff. Now, we don't have a lot. We only have a few. I mean, we're a large congregation, but we're, you know, we furloughed a lot. You know, we furloughed our teachers, but we probably have like, five or six admin staff that are, you know, different clergy assistants and department head assistants and things like that, but they'll help. And if they're trying to get into a program, they'll help. But I'll tell you, if we move away from seniors because seniors are less and less active, one second, uh, Marty, I don't know if you're stretching or raising your hand. Uh, yeah. Um, the other, the other piece of that is, you know, a lot of people are exercising more now, right? And, and they're looking, they can't train with their trainer 
So they're doing all these YouTubes and buying apps and doing all these different things. What if you created and provided the content and the membership licensing and you did that and you, you know, you can't run a marathon. So let's get 26 people to each run a mile and we'll do a, you know, a, a progressive marathon together as a congregation. Right. And you do it as a relay. Oh, that would be awesome. That's it. That's actually a really cool idea. Right. You do it as a relay and you do it between six congregations. Right. And, and, and one person who runs and you do 26 people, 26.2 people at a time. Right. All you have to do is walk or run a mile. Right. And you do it and there's no interaction. And then you do a celebration at the end and everyone gets a medal or a kiddish cup or like whatever it is, you know, you call it the great schlep. Right. You know, I mean, it could be like a really, right. And again, you could raise money with it, but although that should not be your MO, right. This is about although, engagement. Although you could raise the money for tzedakah as opposed to for the congregation. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I mean, there's a lot of that stuff, right. You know, um, but, but thinking about what are people already doing? People are binging Netflix, right. Do a Netflix viewing party together and then have a discussion afterwards. Right. You know, as opposed to a book club, everyone's going to watch whatever show, whatever movie, whatever it is on that. Okay. You know, and you could even give out the login for people who don't have Netflix because you could do that with enough accounts. Right. You know, do um, uh, audible listening, like as opposed to, right. I mean, there are different things like that. Again, what are people already doing? Right. Give a subscription to, you know, eater or New York Times food and everyone cooks a recipe together and right. There are different, there are different ways. And then by the way, you know, mail everyone a sample of something, right. Sandy made a ruggle. Send everyone a, a ruggle, right. You know, and <laughs> you know, like there, there, one, one, one quick question. Are you helping to subsidize people that don't have the internet? Yeah, we are. We are. Thank you. Marty, yeah. Yes, thank you. Excellent presentation so far. Uh, you're, the audience you're speaking to today is primarily uh, Federation Jewish Men's Clubs, and we have two issues I would like to get some feedback on. The issue number one is we have a hard time connecting with men between the ages of 20 and 60. And maybe you have some ideas with outreach, a better way to connect with those people. That's number one. Number two, in each of our regions, we have a number of synagogues, 250 members or less, and because they don't have a big synergism, uh, synergism of men, they, have, they don't have men's clubs, and they're not providing specific programming for men in their synagogue. Yep. Is there any ideas that you can give that we, how we can – reach out to those type of synagogues and provide a service that would be meaningful. Yeah. So the first piece is it depends how you get count, right? You know, I would like to believe that every synagogue has half, you know, if we're talking about binary, every synagogue has half as many men as they do women, right? You know, or, or maybe it's 60, 40 or seven, right? But they're there. Yeah. Um, so the first piece is move away from the club and think more about the program. Okay. It's less about joining the men's club and more about participating because these men are already doing things, right? How many of them are in a poker game? And I'm going to be sexist for a moment, but I think about my buddies. How many of them are in a bowling league? How many of them are in a poker game? How many of them are playing softball? How many of them are, you know, going out for beers with their friends? How many of them are going to um, get their prostates checked regularly? How many of them are, right? You know, is there a men's health conversation? Is there not a men's softball league, but, um, uh, you know, if, if Tuesday night is softball night where the local softball leagues play and it's not right Tuesday night, this is at this bar is where the pitchers are sponsored by the shul, right. Or by the men's club there. And, it, and all it has to do is have the branding, right. Open up the door. Right. You know, and this is not right. There's a difference between, uh, Jewish Heritage Night at the at Wrigley, right? There's a different or or if you're Sox fans, fine. You know, there's a difference between Jewish Heritage Night at Wrigley, you know, or at Target Field here, and trying to figure out how to get people together over something that they're already doing. 
right? The other piece is, I, and again, I don't want to make it totally family-centric. I think that there are two groups of people that you could definitely um, reach out to. Divorced dads and dads in general. I'm not sure. Um, can I, wait, can I just talk to you for a sec? Rob, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, my stomach is really hurting. I'm wondering if I should just wait. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. I don't know if that was on purpose or not. All right. Um, going back to what I was saying, uh, Mari, um, I think divorced dads and dads in general, you know, a dad's group, you know, would be far more. I mean, I can tell you right now that if I, so I'm 38, I'm a young guy. Okay. If I think about five or six of my closest male Jewish friends here, if I said to them, do you guys want to be in a men's club? They'd say, no. Do you want to talk about dad stuff? Yeah, I'll go. Right. You know, um, I could think about, you know, divorced women and divorced men both are generally, you know, on the fringes of the, the periphery of the community. There generally isn't divorced programming, but I'll tell you, divorced men generally don't reach out to other divorced men. Divorced women often do connect with other divorced women. And so there could be a whole divorced male men's program around that. And then, you know, it will, it will grow from it because now this person's doing it and then they're going to talk to their married friends, their single friends, their, right? And there could be, you know, but I think men's health is another big area. You know, if you did regular men's health geared towards different target ages, right? A 30-year-old guy, God willing, is not getting his prostate checked, right? But I'll tell you what, you know, fertility, infertility, you have a, you have a private conversation for men on infertility, right? You know, I guarantee you get 20 people to that, right? You know, I mean, there's, there are different pieces around that. But again, it's about content. And you don't charge for it. You don't collect money at the door. You know, all you do is you get their name and their email. And then you make sure to, to reach out to them afterwards and, and continue to engage. Let's do one or two more questions and then uh, we'll wrap up. Well, what about that, the question? That, what about the question of connecting with smaller synagogues that don't have men's clubs? Yeah, I think you know the question is what is the purpose of the men's club, right? To me, the idea of the men's club used to be because you didn't have co-gender programming, you didn't have co-educational programming. The men did things with the men, and the women did things with the women, and that was back in the back in the day. The other side of it, though, is I think in a large congregation where you have a thousand family units or whatever you want to call it, it, a men's club makes the synagogue feel smaller. That's part of the goal. It creates a community within a community. You need these cohorts, young families, young adults, men's club, women's club, seniors, all this kind of stuff. But if you're a congregation of a hundred families, 200 families, even 300 families, I'm not so sure you need the men's club. You just might need the men's programming, right? And then, and then the cohorts build out of that. You might need to have a Havara incubator instead, right? And I could tell you all about our Havara incubators, you know, in the past. But you might need a Havara incubator, and then you could do specialty, you know, you know, special demographic-based in incubation. We're going to do young men for this incubator, and we're going to do, you know, parents of young children for this incubator, and we're going to do widows for this incubator, and, you know, that may be part of it. Do one more. Yeah. Any others to close? How do you, how do you think going, going into the winter for many of us who live in the northern climates where we don't have that possibility of being outside? We have a few minyanim outside, not a lot of people, but for the few of us who are, who are going once in a while, it is really very nice. But, you know, once the winter sets in, it will be almost impossible. What, how do you how do you envision you know trying to still because it's, it's going to mostly be on Zoom we won't be able to be yeah. outside. How do you um, envision we, on we, connecting? We we haven't done this yet, but um, I'm going to be pushing our leadership to think about engaging mental health practitioners and having a team of mental health professionals that are affiliated and work for the synagogue, and because I I think. Um, that's going to be the challenge three to six months from now. Yeah, that we're, 
We actually and, have a psychologist from our congregation with a couple of physicians, and I, I agree with you. I think that I think even though pe even people like me who are saying we're okay, we're okay, for many people in a few months, it's it's going to be it's going to be overwhelming. I mean, I I will tell you, and this is where we can end. What I have found as the most troubling is people don't have a sense of time. They don't have a sense of time of when they should stop doing things, when they're doing too much, when they're not doing enough. They don't have a sense of time what day it is, what time it is. I got a call two weeks ago because now stuff forwards to my cell phone, right? I got a call two weeks ago at four in the morning of someone asking what time Mincha was. And I, you know, I thought it was a death. Um, I didn't know what it was and I responded and they said to me, oh, sorry, I didn't realize what time it was. I've just been up working. You know, that, right? I'm less concerned about them calling me at 4 a.m., but no one needs to call me at 4 a.m. to figure out what time Mincha is. I'm more concerned about why didn't they realize what time it was? And that, to me, is just a small indicator, indicator of where we're going, so. Thank you. So thank you. Alan, thank you for the opportunity, and thank you all uh, for the opportunity. I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to continue learning one day in the future, and I just wish you all uh, the best of luck as we continue to get through this. Well, Rabbi, that was just fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for spending it with us. We really learned a lot. I want to make sure that other people watch this. And we are recording it, so we'll be on tape. And um, this has very, been very valuable for me, and I know it will be for others as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Stay safe. I hope your family is safe and healthy. Thank you all for participating. Have a good evening. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Take Take care. Care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Thank you, Alan, for putting this together. It was great. Thank you, Alan. Does, does, any, does anybody have any other suggestions of how to keep people connected that you've used in your synagogue?